we are very proud today, as I mentioned, to have uh, be kicking off the Women's History Month uh, with our Slow Food Live for Snail of Approval awardees, particularly uh, women-owned businesses. We have women here with us today who are doing the hard work of good, clean, and fair business running. Um, we are going to be moderated today by Jody Potma, who is a chapter leader in Slow Food Boulder, Boulder County in Colorado. And um, we are going to just let her take away. We're going to, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We'll be moderating those and bringing them up as we go through and as we get to meet these amazing business owners and hear about their slow food experiences. So Jody, why don't you take it away? My thanks, Mara. And I would like to say happy spring to everyone. Um, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Thanks to you to Slow Food USA for providing this forum um, for women run businesses and for allowing me to moderate. And once again, happy spring. Gosh, it's been a long winter, hasn't it? Anyway, um, so Women's History Month began um, as Women's History Week in 1982 but it took an additional five years for it to actually be celebrated as for the entire month. Um, since then, our country has highlighted women and their contributions in every aspect um, of our world. Today, we are going to celebrate slow food women visionaries and how they are contributing to their local communities to strengthen good, clean, and fair food for all principles. Gender and diversity, especially in the food world, showcases culture and flavors. Most of us have cherished, most of us have cherished memories of our grandmothers or a team, a team of female relatives cooking together for our families. And there's no better way to honor heritage than paying homage to our ancestors than through food we create. And these women here are stars in their field. All of the women today own businesses who have earned the snail approval. We've talked about that a couple of times. It is a chapter driven award that celebrates businesses leading good, clean and fair practices. To learn more about the snail of approval award, Brian, I believe put that in the chat, but you can go to slowfoodusa.org slash snail of approval, or you can check out your local chapter. We all have an area on our um, pages about our local winners. So, hang on, just a second. I'd like to introduce the panel today um, and then I will turn it over to each one of them. So Suzanne Simon from Chia Tacos in Washington DC is a conscientious taqueria that focuses primarily on six types of tacos at a time. And this ensures they procure the freshest, most seasonal ingredients. And then we have Rachel Sopdek from Skagit, Valley, Washington, I know I butchered that, is the founder of Water Tank Bakery, and she took her pa passion for grains and baking to a whole new level. We have Debbie Petula from the Whistling Boar in Long Longmont, Colorado. She moved to Colorado from New York City in 2016 to work closer with farmers to create a hyper-local catering company with extraordinary attention to, attention to detail. And then we have Gurgana Karabablav from the Sonoma. She originally, she started the Sonoma County Farmer's Market at a booth called Mommy's Yummies, which featured Mediterranean specialties. And then in about 2018, she had the opportunity to take over a Patisseria Angelica. So without further ado, let's go ahead into the questions. Um, Let's start with Rachel, who I completely butchered everything. Your probably <laughs> last name and where you live, so you can fix all of that for me. But what is your perception of gender representation in food businesses, either broadly or within your community? Well, thank you for having me. I'm Rachel Subcheck, and it's it's not an easy last name to pronounce. <laughs> I understand that. And I am from the Skagit Valley, which is about an hour north of Seattle on the West Coast in Washington which is a beautiful agricultural area that has an incredible amount of crop diversity, including uh, grain production, which some people know um, through the grain development program through uh, WSU Extension, which has led to a new West Coast grain production movement. Um, so my interpretation, uh, uh, 
or my ex can you add sorry can sure. you add it's, what, yeah. what's your perception of the gender representation in food businesses either more broadly or within your community so Washington or where you have come from before yeah uh, I think we have a long way to go um, and it's improving so representation is is present and uh, uh, luckily within my community, I'm able to network with um, chefs that per use my bread and some of which are women. One right down the street at the Skagit Landing restaurant, um, which is chef uh, owned, woman owned. And so, you know, we, I do see some increasing uh, gendered representation, but we have a long way to go. Awesome. Anyone would like to add anything else before I ask the next question? All right, well, Suzanne, you're up because I'd like to know about strengths and challenges um, related to what you're doing and your gender um, and your business ownership in Washington. Um, yeah, I'm Suzanne Simon. I am with the restaurant Chaya. We're an unconventional taco shop with a focus on seasonal vegetables. Um, and we have three locations in DC. Um, and so I, you know, I'm, I think I'm here today because, you know, we have the snail of approval, but also as a, you know, as a business owner, I, you know, I think some of the challenges are the, um, the, what I experience here in DC is that the representation is there, meaning, you know, there are lots of organizations and um, groups to support women or have industry events or networking. You know, I have, I find those, but I think it's really one of the challenges is creating the landscape or the environment for women to feel competent and then for women to also gain access to capital because we're here as business owners and that's one of the biggest challenges. And so until we kind of set up, you know, that this, this like, until we, we create almost these systems that enable us to be these role models. I mean, you know, I, I feel like I'm a role model and I, um, for a long time, I didn't see myself that way. So when I say confidence, you know, I, it's taken me a long time to get to this point where my, you know, my daughter, I have a 20 something, she's like, mom, so many people look up to you. And I'm like, I just own have three little taco shops. But I think that plays into this larger issue of, you know, when I say I just have three little taco shops, the role model that so many people out there continue to think of when we think of business owners and successful businesses are the Jeff Bezos or the <laughs> Mark Zuckerbergs or the, you know, all of these famous people that come to mind as business owners and entrepreneurs and people who have grown things. But there are so many women out there who aren't household names. And until that starts to happen, we're going to continue to have these challenges of confidence in women to be business owners and confidence in, and the ability for women to get money because, um, still most you know men are 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 providing the money to women and um and and also women don't necessarily see them you know they're not there's that unconscious bias that is there when repeatedly all we see are men in business um so you know i think those are some of the challenges that are specific um to being a woman business owner um and kind of navigating, you know, this this landscape and just setting this next generation, you know, these 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 women that are in all of these STEM programs and are coming out of school, you know, really setting them up for success when they come out. It's a great answer, and I wanted to actually bring that the, the future generation of women-owned businesses to Debbie. Um, so my question for you, Debbie, is there, unless anyone would like to add anything else. To, to what Suzanne said, because it was very, um, there was a lot of breadth and depth in that answer. <laughs> All right, so what, um, so Debbie, how do you see the future generation of women businesses? Um, how are they going to thrive in this new and different way um, than the current generation? Because, you know, I love what Suzanne said there with, we have these models and now we're starting to, there's a lot more fluidity, I think, and we're looking up to people in different ways, especially women. I think uh, 
the landscape of what business owners look like is beginning to change. I mean, I coming from New York, oh, and I'm Debbie <laughs> Patula. Um, I am the owner of Whistling Boar, a farm table catering company here in Boulder County. Um, my partner is my husband. Um, him and I met in a kitchen in New York, actually. And just going back to that um, experience coming up in kitchens in New York, I was very rare. I was the rare person in the kitchen. Um, I remember working for Spice Market, which is a Jean George or was, I don't think it's there anymore, Jean George restaurant. And there's 15 to 20 cooks on a line um, at a time. And it was myself and maybe one other person, you know, at that time. And I feel like that's changing since I've been here in Colorado. I've met a lot of women uh, entrepreneurs uh, in catering and in venue management, et cetera. Um, so I do think that is changing and the, and the landscape of what owners, business owners and entrepreneurs are looking like is going to change. And I think definitely for my daughter, she feels like she can do anything, anything. And um, I think that just comes from being exposed to these different creative people um, that just happen to, you know, represent her gender. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, that the these the the outlook will change. We will it will be there will be more leaders and more heroes for our young people to look look to. I mean, That's and we're raising them. I mean, we are you know, that generation who's raising um, these young people. So yeah, I think that will change. Hopefully. <laughs> so my next question is for Gergana. And um, you, are, I, I believe you said that you're from Bulgaria originally. And then, so tell me more about, you know, how you got connected to Slow Food. How did you, um, how, how have you moved from one area to another area and created this amazing business and um, really that showcases your talents. Hello, yes, my name is Gergana Karabilov and I'm so happy to be here. And I am the owner of this um, pretty small bakery here in the small town of Sebastopol in Northern California. Um, I immigrated from my home country, Bulgaria, exactly 21 years ago, and uh, I came as an exchange student, so with that program, but I've always been around food and decided to um, go and um, work for getting my chef certificate as well as a pastry certificate, baking and pastry. So at first, yes, I was doing just farmer's markets and selling uh, my Bulgarian food at a small booth at the farmer's market. And of course, this way I've always been exposed to the most local, organic, natural. You, my kids would run around the market and they would just eat, uh, you know, an apple or get a carrot from the other vendor. And so this always has been very, very important for me that um, I raise them and I feed them and we as a family eat the food like we would do in Bulgaria, so seasonal, uh, super fresh and in the same way supporting our uh, fellow vendors. And then um, at one point I did find out that this business, which is Angelica, was for sale and I came and met with the owners, so everything that they were doing uh, fell really close to me and they were women owners as well, um, but they were doing everything right with um, everything that slow food uh, stands behind, you know, doing their part and getting local eggs, organic, um, not using artificial ingredients in any of their product, and they had a great follower because of that. People would taste it, and once you taste it, they would appreciate the big difference between, um, you know, our ingredients and our cakes and otherwise. And so I would say, maybe I'm going back to women owned, but I believe that the foundations are here for um, more women owning businesses, which is great, but I can tell that I've seen many challenges when somebody 
would come and be like, oh, can I talk to the owner or manager of that place? And I'm like, well, that would be me. And they really hesitate that, wow, you're Slavic and you are a business owner. So I'm constantly asked where I'm from. And uh, it seems that people do have a little hard time grasping that immigrant women can also come into their own and run a strong business. But hey, here we are. And uh, thankfully, Slow Food really supports us. And we're so happy for that. I'm really happy to be part of that organization. It's amazing. Excellent. Um, I just, I wanted to just double check on something. I believe that all of these businesses are less than 10 years old. Is that correct? So that speaks volumes, I feel like, for women-owned businesses and, and being able to be, to, to be brave and, you know, break through that glass ceiling, as they would say. Um, it's not really my favorite term, but anyway. <laughs> um, so my next question for you, and I'm going to open this up to whomever would like to answer it. Um, how would you recommend or suggest your community engage more in women-owned businesses, or if they wanted to start a business as well? So, and I would like just to open it up to anyone that would like to answer that. Well, I'm going to pick Rachel. <laughs> I think so. um, well, what I would say, and I've spoken to some uh, younger women already and students. I enjoy having students come and visit the bakery. And one thing that I always come back to is uh, advocating and not taking no and not being put off and not, not being shoved aside when you need to get something done in order to get your business either up and going or to the next level and doing it in a way that's diplomatic but firm. And often I think that startles people, but if it could be a skill that women include as a, as a part of understanding what business needs, then I, that served me very well. And I would, uh, I would say that, that, that if I could pass anything to, I don't know if it's speaking a little bit about uh, what the next generation is going to be experiencing, it would be that because the systems are still set up to, to be controlled by people who make assumptions based upon how they interpret you or what you look like or what gender you are. And all of those things that we luckily are discussing more and more every day and thank God for that. But anyway, I think maybe I went off topic a little bit, but I don't think so. <laughs> that, is, that is a huge part of, of uh, advocacy for oneself within each moment in a business, which is very difficult because it's not taught often. And even if you think you are a strong woman, when it comes to your intimate relationships to be in the public domain where you have to every day talk to customers and lenders and people who are gonna certify your space and all those challenges, just being, being uh, not taking no <laughs> for an answer. Okay. Typically, women have a skill of multitasking that, that is really important, especially when you're running a food business, for sure. Um, Suzanne, would you like to add anything to that? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's okay. I, I guess I would just add to that. The question was, um, how can the audience better support women businesses, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would just add to that, like, I, you know, I'm not someone that thinks that women should be put in a particular position because they're women, right? I actually think that women are very talented and can do, I believe that we can do anything that, you know, our male counterparts can do. And, but um, I do feel like we do need to be in more leadership roles, whether it is in policy, whether it's in community, whether it's in um, business, whether it's, you know, we do need to be put into those, those roles and we don't, in, and not feel like we have to like fight so hard to get there when we deserve it often. And so, um, you know, again, it's, it's kind of like, how can the audience, you know, help just, you know, be mindful of the fact that I think there's this misperception that 
raising our kids, you know, I have two daughters raising our kids. We, we tell them they can do anything. Um, Debbie just said that I know that they can do anything. I know that they're, you know, going to come out of school as smart professional, you know, women who are competent. It's this in-between phase of what happens after they leave school. And all of a sudden they realize like, oh, you know, I thought this was easy in school. I thought we were all the same here on the same. And then they realize they're not. And so what I have found with working with a few millennials, which um, has really kind of opened up my uh, awareness of this is that there were several women that came and worked with um, our company when they were first out of school. And um, they were super excited about the fact that we were two women business owners. We had this incredible sustainable company. You know, it was all these things they believed in. And then just recently, you know, I saw them both independently thought that, you know, they had moved on. I thought one was in California and New York. And, you know, both of them just were kind of in this like, wow, you know, A, they went off and start tried to start their own businesses and had some problems. Just, you know, I think funding, it's hard. The landscape isn't always set up for women. Capital is difficult. And B, um, they just kind of felt left down. And now they're in their 30s and they're thinking about families and kids and they're trying to think about, you know, where, how that works with trying to build a business or trying to you know, build their career. And so we haven't really set these girls up at this young age. We've set them up with saying, you can do anything. And yes, you can be in these programs and you can, you know, be a leader and you can run a company, you can do that. But we also haven't set them up for the, the, the challenges of that. And then also just, you know, kind of the demands that women have that men, you know, oftentimes men don't, you know, they're not always the person who is making the meals and packing the lunches. And that's one of the benefits I think women bring to the table as leaders and in business is that we are these nurturing people. And we do look at things holistically. And we care about certain things that, you know, we see and, our perspectives matter. Um, and so I think that it's oftentimes, you know, we treat our businesses like we, you know, might treat our children, you know, we're looking at them and trying to make sure we're setting them up for success constantly. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we have to do a better job of setting these girls who, you know, are smart and are doing everything that they need to do to to enter the work world. And then from there, we need to continue to set them up for success because that's where it's getting really fuzzy, I feel like. There's support there, but the support doesn't match the positions um, and the pay and the time off that women often need and all these other things. So um, I think we have work to do. I think you know, the audience, I think people acknowledging and recognizing that is where like, once we've all, you know, recognize that there, there still is this, this work that needs to be done it is how people can help um, propel women forward. Wow, that was a great answer. And I just read an article about the mental load that women carry constantly that it may not be shared. And, and I think you just said it all right there. So that was a great answer. Um, so Debbie, I wanted to go to you about, um, to talk about the snail approval. Let's talk about that for a minute. And because um, we've got, everyone else is, has, is near a coast, you're not. <laughs> so how are you able to meet those snail of approval, good, clean, fair um, practices um, in such a landlocked state? And what is your relationship with farmers, um, creameries, producers, and whatnot? Well, I have to uh, give it, you know, give it up to my husband for most of those relationships. Um, when we first moved here, um, we came here in 2016 and he had, uh, he got a job as, as an executive chef at a restaurant in Boulder. And the first thing he did was start looking for where he can get food from. That job didn't work out because they didn't care <laughs> where the food came from. They wanted him to keep food costs and budget down, you know, uh, labor budget down. And we realized that we had to do this on our own. Um, but every place that he has worked, um, 
he has built those relationships. Um, he, you know, he creates the menus for the company. I do everything else, but he creates the menus for the company. And it's always about what is going on at Community Table Farm or Speedwell or, you know, Lazy Jays or, you know, Sky, you know, at one point Sky Pilot. And then it grew from there. Um, it started with just the people who were surrounding our kitchen in Longmont. And then it went to, well, there's a, a amazing, you know, rancher in South Southern Colorado, you know, how can I arrange to meet him? And um, the mushroom guy from Sedalia, I mean, just, he just worked at it. There's no, nothing else that we could really do except that he built those relationships one by one. Um, a lot of them were not trusting of chefs, uh, you know, restaurants, they get one thing from a farmer, but then it, the cost is too high. And that's what we experienced when we were working at restaurants. You know, the cost is too high and you go back to your, you know, Cisco or whatever it is who's bringing the food in. Um, he was consistent and just always searching for the best product he can get locally and sticking with it, creating menus. This is what, when people come to us for a wedding, for a corporate event, you know, CU event, whatever it is, we are building those menus based on what is growing around us. And so that is basically all we can do. And in terms of fish, alamosa, you know, you gotta want the trout if, you know, this is what we have. Um, we definitely will bring in anything folks need, but we will always offer what is growing locally and then what is growing, you know, within the state first and foremost. Um, and that's just something we've always stuck to. That's why we came all the way out here. Being in, in Brooklyn, we had a restaurant in Brooklyn. You know, the farms were five hours away in upstate New York. There's no way to create a relationship. And so when we came here, that was our number one focus. And that took time. You know, we've, it's now, you know, 2016, it's now six, you know, six plus years we've been here. It took time to get where we are. Get, it took time for slow food to notice us. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's just that's just what we do. We just built, it's about building relationships and making sure that we represent what's growing here first and foremost. That, that was a great answer too. And, and Gurgana, I wanna ask you the same question because you went from a, um, the farmer's market in Sonoma and to a bakery. So what did you do to transition and, and stay true to those snail of approval um, practices going from you know, a smaller shop to taking over um, a, a patisserie? Yeah, pretty much just, again, I was already familiar with most of the practices. Very helpful that I knew all the local vendors, let's say with organic eggs and organic cream and milk, which we use here in cakes as well. Obviously not vegetables as much, but um, everything else. So um, just like David said, those connections, you already have those established and you're already friends, like I said, fellow vendors. And sometimes you trade a cake for eggs, you know, like that. So um, that is the great connection there and uh, the friendships that you make. It wasn't hard. And um, I, like I said, I felt like even the previous owners were very strongly going in that direction and doing that already. So it was a very easy transition and just following with those uh, amazing practices and staying true to the all natural, you know, recycle way and everything that's possible, um, food waste and all of that. Awesome. So Rachel, I've got a question for you. We're same, same theme, snail of approval. Here in Colorado, we have something called the Colorado Grain Chain that's um, working to create, um, connect the farmers to the millers, to the bakers, uh, distillers, brewers, et cetera. Does Washington have something similar or where, how are you um, obtaining your grains for the snail? Um, yeah, so before I started my bakery, uh, we have, been going through a grain revolution here like on the west side of the mountains. And I was amazed that nobody was stepping into the role that I was lucky enough to take before me because I would drive down the road and see all this wheat growing. And I went to the grain gathering, which was put was sponsored by uh, WSU Extension, 
So Steve Jones, who is a PhD uh, faculty, has been developing grain for, I think, over 15 years now. I've been here since 2007, and it was already active at that time. And he was working towards uh, developing grains that would be high nutritional value and grow well within a little bit of a wetter climate, which we have here versus the east side of the mountains. And so I actually moved to this area um, to work at a bakery and they, they were not using local grain because it was not yet available as a milled product. So in the time since 2007, um, a, actually a dear friend of mine opened a mill which utilizes local grains and started taking taking his relationships. So that's Cairn Spring Mills. And they you can look up there. They do a, a real unusual type of milling where it's it's a European style. So it's types of flour. So type, you may have heard of type 00 for uh, pasta. But um, so I, I'm lucky enough to be able to use a variety of types of flour that are made from this local grain and include a lot more nutrition and whole grain uh, oils and nutritional value. And, um, and I've benefited from years and years of uh, people working towards this uh, product, which I can now showcase. So I'm, I'm very lucky. And I do all sourdough based bread. So I use a long fermentation process that uh, develops maximum flavor and shelf life and better for your gut. And uh, so I'm really lucky to be given this, this, this place, which is growing the grain. All the grain for my bread currently, this year's harvest was grown within 12 miles of the bakery, which is incredible for me to be able to say that. And it does definitely reduced my profit margin to be using this local grain, but it's a commitment that I've made since I started. And I, I just think the, the quality of this, the flour that I'm using is much, much superior to the, those bigger granaries. Well, that commitment is oh. incredible. 12 miles. That's huge. <laughs> and do you, yes. mill, and Karen Springs mills it for you or do you? Yes. So so I actually am located right next to the mill. There's oh, a, a, a we are all, it's, you know, it's a big community effort that's been uh, leading to my, my business being a success. So the Port of Skagit, which is, it has a mission that's beyond uh, just creating an airport or a business park. They want to, they want to help and, uh, uh, so they've created this genuine Skagit Valley logo and and icon, which now is uh, being utilized to try to promote, similar to Napa Valley, our valley. So, so with the support of that organization and the work of WSU Extension and the leadership there on with grain, and then also now this mill, Karen Spring Mills, um, I've. I'm able to have fresh flour forklifted right over to my bakery uh, weekly. So it's pretty That's amazing. That really is yeah. truly amazing. Yeah, I'm pinching myself every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about your sourcing as well, Suzanne. You did um, talk a little bit about, you know, your local farms, but do you want to highlight anybody? Do you want to highlight, you know, what your tacos are wrapped in and any of that fun stuff? Yeah, I'm um, sure. I, well, first of all, I just want to say, um, you know, I, I feel like having this snail, you know, snail of approval award, actually, like when you recognize things like what Rachel just said about her product, I mean, there, it's, is such an honor to be in this group because there is so much hard work <laughs> that goes into so many of our products and so much time that goes into sourcing and being very intentional about things. And I think that's the whole point of slow food. At least that's like, you know, how I was introduced to it. I actually have an environmental science background. And so I always was interested in like that intersection of food and the environment and, you know, um, just doing things the right way and quality. And so, you know, I think as the business owners on this panel, like we all just admire and, you know, are inspired by each other because we all know like how difficult <laughs> it is um, sometimes. Um, 
but as far as our sourcing practices, I mean, we started at the farmer's market and our mission was, um, A, you know, we started creating those connections with the farmers um, at those markets where we were buying food from their tables because we were thinking when we were developing our menu and our concept, like, why are there all these beautiful vegetables here on these tables from these farmers? They come into an urban area, Washington, DC, you know, weekly. Um, people are buying this, they wanna cook this way at home, but yet there's so little represented on menus, particularly in like a fast casual setting. And so Ooh. our goal is to really like, look at what the farmers had. I mean, we, we started with, you know, we'd go to their tables, we'd see what they'd have, they would give it to us like at the end of the market. And then we would take it for the week and create, um, you know, our version of a vegetarian vegan taco out of these fresh vegetables. And so we made a lot of connections with the farmers in this region, this mid Atlantic area. And, you know, there was a very large co-op with probably 30 farmers that we were sourcing from. Um, unfortunately with COVID, um, a lot of those farmers were hit pretty hard and um, that some of those co-ops that actually offered a lot of the distribution um, just closed down. And so now I think we're seeing more as we try to continue to source more, you know, as much local ingredients as we can, we're finding that we have to do a lot of that more through the um, vendors than we can do directly with the farmers just because their distribution just kind of came to a halt without these larger co-ops kind of you know almost acting as their channel to get their stuff to to people so sourcing has become a uh, vegetables for us has become difficult i will say that um the corn tortillas we um, you know, another thing I love about slow food and I always think about uh, slow food is usually, you know, the restaurants that are part of the organization or endorsed by it have some, you know, traditional method or slow way of making something. And so we hand press our corn tortillas and um, we, prior to COVID, always used uh, a... Um, uh, masa that was that's milled by Bob's Red Mill um, and you know great company um, really loved their product and we couldn't get it during COVID and we still can't get it so now we are using an organic um, masa you know as much as we can but we have real problems with getting um, good quality masa at the moment. Um, we're still hand pressing everything and making it in that traditional slow food way. And it doesn't have any processed, you know, foods. It doesn't have any preservatives or anything. But, you know, again, I think this is what for people who are really trying to source those good ingredients and like use slow methods of producing something, um, a lot of it is the distribution that is a real challenge right now and what we're what we're seeing. Um, but yeah, we hand press everything. We don't have preservatives, no, you know, dyes in our food. Um, you know, we're, we stay pretty true to, we don't use the, um, you know, we don't have any of the impossible meats um, in our you. restaurant. We, you know, rely, we're, we're were a menu based on vegetables, um, things that are actually growing and real and have a season. And I don't know, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Um. <laughs> so, um, Brian, do we have any um, questions coming through the chat? Um, because if not, I've got a, another question for the, the group. Yeah, I'm with it, Jody. Okay. So, because it's Women's History Month and, you know, we didn't start out by ourselves, I'd like to know um, from your heritage, you know, what is the one thing like your grandmother or mother instilled in you or your the favorite recipe or something? Uh, when you said sourdough, Rachel, it made me think of this question because uh, <laughs> I want to know how old your sourdough is. But um, I want to know, like, what is one recipe that you may have learned from your grandmother, mother, that you have either carried towards your, in your restaurant or you make for your family um, that is in that slow food tradition? So let's, since Suzanne, you just finished, why don't we start with you and then you can 
popcorn it to somebody else. Oh, wow. Um, well, I have to say, I, I, I have my, my mom worked and um, she didn't have necessarily a recipe that she passed that, that I would create again today. She was a, a woman of the 70s, very much into pop it in the oven from a box and, or, or put it in the, in the crock pot and let it go all day. Um, so, but my grandmother did always have Sunday dinner and she made these incredible um, like handmade noodles where she would, you know, roll out the dough and cut them. And I remember as a kid, you know, loving being in there, just whether it was playing with that dough or, you know, rolling it around and making my own noodle, my own size. And just, you know, they were always just so delicious. And, you know, I think I just, A, have two things that happened. I had a mom who was working. So I had to often, she often just like left recipes on the counter or she was like, okay, I need you to do this, this and this and I'll be home at this time. So I learned how to be independent in the kitchen or make my own snacks after school. I didn't have a mom home who was making me snacks. Um, I was always coming home starving and making my own thing. And then secondly, I did have, you know, a grandmother who had an appreciation for, you know, cooking meals and gathering at the table and um, making things from scratch. And so I guess it's that combination that has come together in me. Awesome. Um, Gurgana, would you like to answer that same question? Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to sweets, because we, I do work in a, a patisserie, I brought my absolute favorite baklava recipe with me. And so, so many people are excited about it because yes, they come here for the cake, but like last week, I could not keep up with the demand. They would call and order 12 and 12 and 12. They love it. So, you know, I cannot tell you the whole recipe because it's a secret, but I go for the local honey and I go for the organic butter. And that's why it tastes amazing. And that is one of the reasons I am so connected to this food. I have always loved food and I love people that love food and that appreciate food. But yes, I wanted to bring some of my own heritage, either with the savory food when we are making the gyros and the falafels and the traditional uh, Bulgarian salads, or now with the patisserie, I still want to bring something from my own country, of course, in the way of the slow food, which is even more amazing because I have to say back there, Yes, we were, um, I learned to preserve when uh, the season is there and we don't have those box dinners because we're such a small country and we don't have those freezers back in the day where you can have everything all year round. So using local, using seasonal is the way I'm raised and is the way I'm raising my kids and is the way I, you know, want to um, teach, well, not teach, but to have my food, uh, to Americans, so I hope that they enjoy it. But yes, baklava, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, I don't admit. Okay, I um, know we're getting close, but I really want to hear what Rachel and Debbie have to say with, with heritage and um, what they've learned from their, their grandmothers and moms. So Rachel, you first and then Debbie. Okay, I'll make it fast. Uh, so I, I was inspired by my, my mom facilitated my relationships with other m mothers is what I call them. And they're women I grew up auntie type figures, one of which owned a bakery in our local food co-op, another which was uh, my best friend's mom who grew a lot of her own food and garden and her mother, we would go to their farm uh, once for a week in the summer and she taught me how to bake and make everything from scratch. And so I, I like, the other panelists have always loved food and been inspired by the women who are my other mothers, so. Thank you. Debbie. Up your mute. Oh, there you go. Well, coming, you know, my family immigrated here from South America. Um, we were from Guyana and Guyana is the only English speaking Caribbean cultured country in South America. And so I come, you know, 
I bring a lot of Caribbean flavors to our menu. So we have a whole Caribbean profile, um, things that we, we bring out every once in a while. And we have one client that religiously orders for his party, a Caribbean feast every year. Um, but what I think the, the thing that is the closest to me is when we came to this country, my grandparents brought a brownstone in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and it had a double lot. It was one of the very few properties that had a double lot. And so my grandmother, you know, always grew up growing her own food. My mom, the same. We turned the second half of that lot into our garden. And at one point, if you look through the history of, of Brooklyn, there were um, fig trees. Brooklyn had a lot of fig trees. So we had fig trees, we had an apple, we had peach trees. Every, I remember every fall hating being over at my grandmother's house because we had to harvest everything, clean everything, clean all the bugs out, you know, the cabbage, you know, whatever it was. And we grew a lot of food. We ate primarily from what we grew, you know, as a child. Um, so I would, give anything for that right now. I would give mm -hmm. anything to have that garden um, here in Louisville. Um, so I think that's, you know, aside from the afro indio caribbean menus that we have um, at Whistling Boar, just this innate love of having things just grown out of the ground and that is what you're using. And so that's what I bring you know, and, you know, Dave being the same, you know, um, his grandmother had a garden where they grew a lot of their food, you know, and she's from Udine, Italy. Um, so yeah, our love for, for that farm fresh food and, and being able to cook and eat what you grow. Awesome. All right, Brian, we're ready for questions from the audience. I can pop in actually and read them. Oh, we hi, Mara. Have all right. Hi. Uh, this has been such a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, for your great answers and letting us in a little bit on your history and your stories. Um, Rebecca has a question about um, when you're considering organic versus local, how do you prioritize um, for sourcing? Um, I would just, and is there a benefit either way? Yeah, looks like um, that's got a quick answer. Um, that's because that's what we do. <laughs> that's our, that's our thing. Um, local always first always first. And we're very mindful of, I mean, I can't say anything negative about any of the farms that are in the, our vicinity in Longmont, but um, we definitely are looking to, cre to know these farmers and understand why they're doing what they're doing, understanding, just hearing things like they want to be good stewards to the land in which they're growing their food is enough for, for us to be like, okay, what are you growing? You know, because that's super important. Our land, the quality of our land is important. So local always first and then organic for us, you know, and because how could we not? Longmont is just filled with farms and, you know, getting to know, I think a lot of the majority of the farmers out here in Longmont, like everyone really cares and loves what they're doing. And so, that's a no-brainer for us, local first. Amazing. Anyone else want to answer that question? I'll just say I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree also. Awesome. <laughs> and I agree too. And I know that just working around farmers market, sometimes they definitely do use those practices as an organic farmers. It's just so expensive to get that certification. Otherwise, they do absolutely the same, no spray. Uh, so that's why, yes, local, I mean, our customers also ask very often about organic, but once they know how we source it and uh, that local, sometimes it is more important just because it costs those farmers so much more to get that certification, but they indeed are already organic farmers. Totally. And that speaks to that relationship building, right? Like if you have the relationship, then you can have the conversation and then you can decide for yourself um, if sourcing is good. But we just got another great question. Do any of you use backyard gardeners as sources or your own gardens for your businesses? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we, do, <laughs> we do have a, a little uh, garden um, in our kitchen. 
um, that we grow things like edible flowers and, you know, just squashes, easy things that we can manage with our time and with the land. Um, but we don't have too many backyard farmers um, that we know of. I mean, we certainly would love it. We've had had people give us like rhubarb, like their crop of rhubarb, and we've done something special with that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we have a little garden in at our kitchen that we definitely grow small amounts of things from. Sorry, go ahead, Gorg Gorgana. Yes, we also related to cakes. We use a lot of flowers to decorate those cakes. So we do have that as far as edible um, flowers. And we love our cakes to be beautiful, not only tasty, because we first eat with our rice, right? And then I personally love, just for the back of our portion, I am a diehard beekeeper, even though I don't have so much time, I do use my own honey for the baklava, even though I have a, like five or six hive only, hives only, so that is great. And then the other part is, yeah, those customers, they love you, they bring you the organic Meyer lemons that their tree is so loaded and they go, oh, they're for your organic Meyer lemon tart, use it. So this is again amazing, the community and the people and yes. Awesome. We got another question here about pricing. Um, how are you all doing with pushback on pricing as every all the sourcing of things has increased um, over the, you know, the, the food chain pricing has become more difficult over the past few years. Um, and also maybe because you source locally, prices could be higher. Um, how do you balance that? And um, is there pushback from your customers? Debbie. <laughs> I'll answer. Um, yes, lots of push. No, I shouldn't say lots of pushback. Um, some pushback for sure. Absolutely. I think that um, it sounds, it's going to sound so cliche, but those who know, know. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> those who understand what goes into sourcing local, understand why the prices are the way they are. And I always, you know, I've done a few talks and my thing is always like, this should be the norm and the prices should be lower. Like being able to go to your local farm should be the normal thing that we do. Um, but it takes so much for them to get grants and so much for them to, to be good stewards of the land and do uh, things properly that they have to charge what they charge. Um, and so we have to charge what we charge because not only are we getting things locally, but everything is from scratch. We also do breads I and mean, we have a sourdough starter and you know, everything has a beginning, you know, sauces or bones that are roasted. And then that's like a, you know, 24 hour process to come up with a demi glass. And so those who know, know. And while there is some pushback, I think that's beginning to shift. Um, just with recognition, more folks are starting to know who we are. And so there's more targeted customers coming to us. I mean, we, you know, we're catering. So the, the, those invoices are high, you know, for a wedding and, and events, et cetera. Um, but I think as we become, as our practices become more known, um, then people who understand what we do start searching us out and don't feel, don't see a sticker shock when it comes to that bill at the end. Amazing. I see a lot of head nodding here. <laughs> I'd like that to say, I also too. think that this time in our economy has really shifted people's perception um, post pandemic and with inflation increasing. And I, I think that things are being so variable within has has led to people being a little bit more open for what are you doing and not questioning so much. Oh. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think just transparency and education is key. I mean, we had a corn taco last um, summer and corn was almost like, it was almost, I think it was like 40% more. Um, and that was a lot for us. And we didn't know what to do about it. Like whether we shouldn't put it on the menu because it was going to, you know, we were pretty much not going, I mean, we are a business and we weren't going to make any money, you know, off of the taco selling it at the price point that we can, that's typical to our industry, you know, our segment of restaurants. And 
So um, we ended up just kind of adding, you know, we had a plus one next to it. We educated the consumers on, you know, where we were sourcing from, you know, the fact that, you know, um, it was uh, in the mid Atlantic region that, you know, it was a seasonal product that we were only going to have it on the menu for a while, but we added a plus one to it. So if you got it, you got a, you know, an extra dollar added on to that taco. And once I think people recognized, like, you know, food fluctuates and prices change and it has to do with farming. It has to do with weather. It has to do with like all kinds of different things. Like they were okay with it. It's, it, I think it's when they don't understand why and they think that you're just like putting ridiculous prices on something. And so I think transparency and like that conversation with your customers, whether it be, you know, just when they're in your shop or Instagram or whatever your social channels are, but like that education piece is part of it and just training them to recognize that, you know, we're like any other business, things go up and down and we can't always keep food prices really flat. Very true. Very true. Communication seems to be key. Do any of you ship your products <laughs> around? Are you all locally based and keeping everything local? Uh, possibly down the road, cookie box. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, everybody keep your eyes on these amazing business owners. Jody, did you have any last words before I wrap it up? No, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. I love learning. I could, I could listen to these gals forever. So thank you. Amazing. Well, we're so grateful to the four of you for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedules to share your slow food story and also just teach us, teach us all about uh, what it takes to be a snail of approval awardee and all the care and um, the care and consideration that it takes to share your passion with your communities. And um, we're so happy to shine the light on your businesses. I wanted to thank Patrizia for doing our interpretation today. Thank my colleague, Brian Solom for doing the tech behind the scenes. Jody, thank you so much for moderating today. And we invite you to learn more about Snail of Approval on our Slow Food USA website. Um, I We invite you to patronize the slow food restaurants in your region and your businesses in your area. Um, check out, we have a beautiful map on our Snail of Approval um, page on Slow Food USA where you can, if you're traveling, use that as your guide. Um, it's a different kind of Yelp altogether. It's a, it's a much level, much more leveled up way to find some really interesting food on your travels. Um, and also check out Slow Food Live Archive for other, um, other content that we've posted for you guys. Um, it's all available on our website as well. And thank you so much for joining us today with Slow Food Live. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.